Now, Lindsay, your story is fascinating because many journalists didn't go to Syria. Some couldn't get the paperwork, others didn't dare go because of the threat to life and limb. But yes, you, as a journalist and a filmmaker, an American journalist and filmmaker, knew the, the um, dangers, and yes, you still decided to go. Tell us why you went. I went, um, I started to go at a time when it was a, a bit safer than it is now, or <clears throat> was in 2016 when I was ultimately kidnapped. But um, in 2014, the border with, with between Turkey and Syria was still open, meaning the journalists could pass. There was a sort of vetting process. The Free Syrian Army had an office on the border and they would you know, screen who was ever picking up journalists and you know, the groups that journalists were embedding with. And it was a bit safer, obviously still not safe. The, the constant bombardment from the Assad regime was a threat and kidnapping was a threat, um, but it was safer. And I went successfully and I got the most compelling material I'd gotten in my entire career. You were there to film the casualties after the airstrikes when they had hit hospitals, schools, marketplaces. Tell me about that. Tell me what you witnessed and filmed. And not only the casualties of, of the, the bombardments, but the realities of life in Syria, where you know resources were very scarce. Um, schools were re routinely bombarded, as were hospitals, marketplaces, civilian areas, while the military areas were largely untouched. Um, so it was amazing to be able to show what was actually happening there and to witness the, the horror of, you know, bombs falling at night and kids waking up out of their beds when a bomb hits nearby and crying and then immediately falling back to sleep because they were so used to the bombardment. It's just such a reality of life there. <laughs> قصفوا خربوا هجروا العيال هجروا الاولاد قصفوا المدارس مسجد كنا عم نصلي فيه كمان قصفوا بحجه الارهاب بحجه مكافحه الارهاب والارهابيين seemed incredibly important to go and it seemed as though I could go and I did you know successfully go seven times before anything truly bad happened now, while you were filming the airstrikes, the Guardian newspaper printed an article saying that militants were hunting you. They were hot on your heels. They were going to catch you any day. What was it like being in Syria, knowing that all of this was ready to engulf you? I mean, they'd already, they had me at that point, so. Um, so they were a bit late with their story, were they? Yeah. Well, it, it was uh, murky, obviously, to anyone who wasn't in Syria, what was actually happening, um, according to Al Nusra at the time, now called HTS, uh, they were just investigating me because they'd heard that I was a CIA agent, um, which is something that they say about practically every foreign journalist that they've kidnapped, um, when re in reality it's just a, a move to hold someone and get someone to pay a ransom for them. So um, I, I'd always known it was a possibility, and I sort of steeled myself for the possibility that it could be a couple of years of being in their custody. So. What happened? They abducted you. Where do they take you? What kind of experience did you have there? Well, first they took me to sort of a prison safe house, I guess you would call it. Um, and I saw a few of these actually in the Idlib countryside, in the western countryside of Aleppo, where it's, it's sort of a house that they've repurposed with like a jail cell in the basement. Um, one exit, one entrance. So guarded all the time and guarded by predominantly foreign Al-Qaeda members. I think that they trusted them more than the, the Syrians. Um, yeah, and I was, I was in the first house for a week. I had what they called the Shura Council come to interview me and ask me questions about why I was in Syria, and they conceded that I had permission to actually be filming in Syria, but they said, you know, we, we think you might be a spy, so we're and very it, sorry, but... And it was obvious that you weren't the first person to be incarcerated, because tell me what was on the wall. Oh, th well, this was later. Um, this was actually in a, a real prison that Al-Qaeda was using where there were many other male prisoners. Um, it was sort of built into the side of a mountain. It looked like it might have been a factory at a previous time, but it was now a prison. And there were hash marks on my wall and blood, which I guess you know denoted how long Marking some the other yeah. prisoner had been there. Now, unbelievably, you managed to escape. And you managed to escape because you struck up a friendship with women that I'm assuming were wives of the militants. And you managed to convince one of them to allow you to use her mobile phone 
so you could tell the family back home that you were okay. She unbelievably gave you the mobile phone. Tell me what you used the mobile phone for and what the outcome was. Well, um, <coughs> excuse me. They actually, they allowed me to use the mobile phone. They, they, they thought they disabled everything, you know, all of the, the Wi-Fi and the apps, but in reality, they hadn't done anything that I couldn't undo. So I, I made a Gmail account and contacted another Syrian friend of mine in Turkey who was able to put me in touch with someone from Aurora al-Sham, an allied faction, and he ultimately came and scoped out the area and made a plan of, of escape for me. So. so you managed to escape and you made it to the Syrian-Turkish border and you must have thought, I'm safe, I'm okay. But that wasn't the case. You were then detained by the Turkish government. Tell me what happened then. After I'd escaped, I, I was still in Syria for a couple of days as I prepared to cross out and make my way to the border, which was, you know, going through more Al Qaeda checkpoints. So I was, I knew that they were probably looking for me, and I was very worried on that front. Um, and so I, I, I obviously had access to a phone then. I was in touch with, um, you know, American officials who assured me that, you know, we've made a deal with Turkey. They're going to let you cross. There's no problem. Just tell us where you'll be going. And I told them my roundabout area, and they suggested a place. And I crossed out. And the moment I did, um, it, there were U.S. officials and Turkish officials on the border. Uh, the Turkish officials told the U.S. officials they had to leave. They told me to get in the back of their truck, and they were arresting me. How much do you think that your nationality was a factor in your abduction? Because we know that there's lots of... Uh, dual nationals and U.S. citizens currently behind bars in Turkey. How much of a factor do you think it was? And do you think that U.S. citizens and dual nationals are being used as bargaining chips? It was the, the entire reason. And they, they said as much when they eventually released me. But um, it, it, bad coincidence that I happened to cross to Turkey um, the night of the coup attempt, or cross to Syria the night of the coup attempt. Um, so the optics were bad, although I don't know why I would be trying to escape to Syria. Um, it was the entire reason that I was imprisoned. And they said, you know, we think you might have something to do with the coup attempt. We think you're a CIA agent. And obviously the a modicum of research into what I was doing and what I'd been doing in Syria, in Syria previously would show that that wasn't the case. But Tell me about the high profile case of Pastor Andrew Bronson, who was freed quite recently. What do you know about that case? Oddly enough, I, I believe that the day that I was actually released was the day that he was arrested. And... I, I don't know why, but as far as anyone knows, we were the only solely American citizens who were in prison. Um, but it, it's not just him. I mean, there, there's a number of Turkish-American dual citizens, such as Serkan Golje, you know, a NASA physicist who's been in prison for more than two years now. Um, the sole piece of evidence against him was that the police searched his parents' home and found a dollar bill. And that was the evidence? That was the evidence, and that remains the only evidence. And he was sentenced to seven and a half years in prison recently. His appeal was successful in that it, it reduced his sentence to five years, but this is five years away from his family um, for no reason. Let's talk about the lengthy prison sentences because journalism has been rebranded as terrorism. And if it's proved that you belong to a terrorist organization, it comes with a really lengthy jail sentence, seven and a half to 43 years in prison. It's incredible, isn't it? And it's not even just 43 and a half. I mean, there have been a number of aggravated life sentences as well that have been upheld on, a, on appeal. Um, you know, a murderer might get a 12-year sentence if it's brutal and in cold blood, but I, I just interviewed an exiled journalist, Severi Guven, in, in Germany now, who was sentenced to 22 and a half years for a magazine cover depicting Erdogan in an unfavorable way. So it's insane. <laughs> When you were in prison, they believed that you were a CIA agent. And as you said, this is quite common. They believe that quite a few people are CIA agents. What kind of treatment did you have when you were in prison? Did you have access to translators, to legal counsel? Did you have clean clothing? I had no clothing. I had the clothes that I had on my back when I escaped Al-Qaeda, which was, you know, the, the black niqab and the black... Burqa, and this was all that I had in prison. Um, and I was placed in a cell, you know, ironically, with women who were accused of being Al Qaeda members. Um, and then later, a, an admitted ISIS member joined our cell. Um, it, no translators allowed. They were absolutely certain until the point that I left that I spoke Turkish, which was laughable. I really didn't. Um, 
And it was bad, but I have to say that, you know, as bad and horrific as it was, you know, in the dead of summer, the water would just switch off. Obviously, no air conditioning or anything, just sun beating into the cell. I know that it must have been much worse for the Turkish prisoners who were held separately. Um, there was a pregnant woman in my cell who gave birth to her child. Uh, the child was ill. The child would not breastfeed. They were feeding it sugar water with a plastic spoon. And it existed in, like, one ratty T-shirt. They refused to take it to the hospital because the gendarme agents didn't feel like taking the, the mother to the hospital. So it, it's just horrific. In the World Press Freedom Index, Turkey is now 157 out of 180, which is truly appalling. Did you ever imagine that being a journalist could be such a dangerous profession? Yes, but only you know intellectually. I think you, you everyone's always heard about whatever country is currently despotic and cracking down on freedom of expression. But you know, as a, I guess a naive American journalist, I always felt. There's a sort of inherent nobility that would protect me in a way. Um, and I'm grateful in a way to have the, the reality in front of me that no, it's not safe and it, it's, you're not protected. It doesn't really matter who you are, or where you're from. You'll have an easier time maybe, but no one's safe. How has the experience that you've been through, the detention twice, how has that affected you and what you do today? Um, I think that the effects weren't immediately clear. I just tried to get on with my life, and I did, um, and continued to travel and continued to report. Obviously, I'm not going to go back to Syria and definitely not going back to Turkey, but it was fine until uh, I was in Iraq for work in June, and apparently Turkey found out that I was in Iraq, and this was at the height of the you know Andrew Brunson row. Mm -hmm. Um, and Turkey tried to send a diffusion request through Interpol, which is like an informal detention request, detain her so we can extradite her, um, which I found out, uh, when, which I discovered when I uh, reapplied for a visa in September, which, you know, made me realize that they're still, and maybe it's the reporting work I've done since that's highly critical, obviously. Um, so what happens now? How do you get off that list? Is it possible to remove yourself or to take steps to make that happen? It is, and, and I'm working on it. It's, you know, it'll take months. But this is another situation where I'm fortunate as an American and as a journalist because there are more than half a million people had their passports revoked or have travel bans in Turkey. And all of these exiled Turkish citizens who will be resettled and have, you know, refugee status or asylum status who will travel could have Interpol detainers on them. And they won't know until they travel somewhere and they could be held. And if it's a country that's, you know, wants to curry favor with Erdogan, then maybe they'll be extradited back to Turkey. So even in the rest of the world, they're not safe.